Hey, good afternoon, known everybody. Yeah, this, this is the old here. Yeah, I'm trying out some, some new uh, microphone. Uh, from TRL Live. Yeah, coming to y'all live right now and everything. So, um, coming to y'all live. It's not 12:08 p.m. here in beautiful sunny South Florida. Temperature going. Talking about 85 degrees. You know, summer's officially here, as you as I figured it would be. But you know, like I said, that's no surprise right there. A lot of things have been going on. I'ma just go here. I'ma switch it up this morning and everything, and I'ma just jump on to the sports world. As you know, in, uh, July 1st, you know, NBA free agency, a lot of clubs has been throwing money around. And uh, preferably, even even the Miami Heat, which basically right now, they don't even have any money. I mean, they they just offered Dwayne Wade uh, yesterday, like, uh, $40 million for two years, you know, $20 million a season, which he really deserves. But right now, the biggest news that came up, that, that's, that's uh, shunk shock waves, is the Kevin Durant. Um, announcement that he was joined, joining the Golden State Warriors. As y'all know, Kevin Durant made his decision yesterday. He joined the Golden State Warriors, three-year deal, um, which was a fifty-four million. Now I've gone ahead and I had asked around several times. I asked around several times about like um, what's been going on about with that. What's been going on with that? That's and a lot of pe- people um, it was saying and saying that it was that Durant did a punk punk move, and it, it it's 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 really it's really it really, it's really pissed me off. Um, it really pissed me off to the to the point. Like, you know, like, the man doesn't have a right to make a decision. I mean, like, that's like, oh, why he went on there and went to Golden State and everything? I mean, you went to a team that basically beat you in the Western Conference Finals and then turn, you know, Western Conference Finals, and then you're going to turn around and sign with the same team that beat you. Now, here's my thing with this. Back in 2010, when LeBron James made the decision to leave uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers to come down here to South Beach, uh, the quote unquote in his words, well, I'm gonna take my talents on this down to South Beach. Nobody then said a word. Now with Durant does it, it's a problem. You know, people don't realize LeBron set that blueprint in tone. Set the tone with the blueprint with, right there with the big three thing or whatever like that. So, you know, like and, you know, like I say, at the end of the day, you know, even even old Coon as uh, Stephen A. Smith, Mr. Uh, Mr. Snuffleupagus himself, coming out there on Twitter, came on Facebook Live, talking noise, saying that what he did was a punk move. And you know, like he took that, he he personal with it because you know he got an issue with Kevin Durant. That's the thing with Stephen A. Smith. I, I'm gonna jump on that line about uh, Bart Simpson looking motherfucker later. Because I feel like this at the end of the day, look. The term, you got to understand, the key word with Kevin Durant, free agent, free agent. You know what that means, people? That means he's got a right to go where he wants, where he pleases, period. And besides, he's already said several times that, you know, saying like that, that he want to get a ring. Because after all, it don't make no sense, you know, you play seven, eight, nine years, you know, with the Oklahoma City Thunder. This is no disrespect to Oklahoma City or whatever like that. And, you know, but in the league itself, per se, that you play in 10 years in the league, and then on top of that, you know, you want to you want to get something out of him. He wants to get him a ring. LeBron got three, two with the Heat, and now one with the Cavaliers. Wade got three. So, you know, why not? Can't get any better and see look what happened in, in, in Vegas. The, the bets are the odds are up that Golden State is now next year it's gonna be the odds on favorite to win it all next year. And who knows? It might be a rematch with the Cavaliers. 
But, you know, we'll see with that because, you know, you got people out here sometimes that, you know, they get too wrapped up into the sports and everything. They try to live their life vicariously through either the, the, the industry itself or the athletes. You know, I mean, like, you got to think, you know, Kevin Durant, he's thinking long term. And besides, he's a grown man. He makes his own decisions. If, if he's seen fit for him to go to the Golden State Warriors, to be over there with Chef Curry, Draymond Green, uh, Clay Thompson, one half of the Splash Brothers, then if, if it's his baddest chances on getting the ring, then you know, like I said, more power to him. Now, as I come across my news feed today, now Russell Westbrook may not be looking to re-sign with OKC. It's caused the ripple effect now. It's caused the ripple effect. Not to the whole NBA, but well, the whole ripple effect to the NBA when the news was flat and through the NFL. But now it, it caused major ripple effects in OKC. Because now if Westbrook leave, what well, OKC got left? You know, Serge Ibaku, he's already gone. He's down here in Orlando. So he's already gone. But, you know, like I said, you know, some people, people need to go ahead and, and get over their self. It's, it's more important things out here in this out here in this, this time and lifetime to be worrying about instead of y'all getting all bent out of shape and getting bitter about what Kevin Durant did saying, oh, that's what he did was a, it, that move he made was a punk move, it was a bitch move and everything, you know, and, and so forth like this. And then of all people be talking Stephen A. Smith. Stephen A. Smith is not the one to be talking about, about a punk move. His punk move was him coming on TV apologizing after that broad Michelle Beadle went on Twitter and started going on that rant during the uh, during the Ray Rice situation, and she totally violated ESPN protocol where she should have been fired. I said this many times. I said this many times, a couple of times on my podcast about it, and you know, and that's the only time with Stephen A. Smith where I would defend him where he spoke up about that was right about the domestic violence thing. And, you know, that's what got him suspended. But what, instead of him, like, you know, had some dignity, he came back on TV like a little bitch and, and apologized and stuff, saying, I was wrong. I was wrong. It's, you know, I, I, but then he turns right back around on that same platform and he goes ahead and throw black people under the bus like he did to the people in Ferguson, like he did to the people in Baltimore, you know. So you know, I, I can't even stand that that little Bart Simpson, Mister Snuffleupagus hairline pushed all the way back to Canada, motherfucker. Can't stand him, you know, because he's too busy been cooning like this for longest. And I, you know me, I, anybody that know me, you know, I have a pure hatred for coons. And, and speaking of which. You know, it's not the only effect, you know, um, in the in the world. I'm going to switch it up. For, I'm going to get away from sports for a second. I'm going to get on back on this. You know, the Jesse Williams uh, speech still got a lot of these white supremacists um, real upset and, then, and so forth like this. It got to the point now where I came across, you go across the news and say, uh, say that, that, you know, that they threatened to boycott Grey's Anatomy. They threatened to boycott Grey's Anatomy or uh, have Jesse Williams fired. You know, I kind of find this very, very laughable. I find that very laughable. Very laughable. Now, the show's creator, which was um, Shonda Rhimes, uh, had already said on, like, on, a Twitter, on a Twitter handle, she said, um, people... Boo don't need a petition. Hashtag Shonda, uh, Shonda Land rules. And also a response for, with Jesse Williams on his Twitter handle, which he also said in response, see, and, it, and it very eloquently, very eloquent. I like this. When they try to return items you don't even carry, then they then demand you demand to speak to the manager to get you fired. <laughs> So true, though so true. The problem with with these with these old white supremacists, the suspected one, um, uh, white ones, you know, they think they go ahead and tweet uh, Shonda Rhimes, the sister who's the producer of Grey's Anatomy, and then the next thing you know, they go ahead and send it 
tweets and all this stuff made these by these trolls uh, to the president of ABC Entertainment. Oh, um, newsflash, you idiots. The president of ABC Entertainment, that's a sister too. And, and it says like this, Jesse isn't going anywhere. Take several seats. Unquote. So in other words, when she's just telling y'all, y'all just sit y'all ass down somewhere. Ain't nobody even thinking about y'all. Be honest with you. Yes, it's just it's just real real ridiculous. And see what Jesse Williams said, and I mentioned the list on plenty on plenty of situations. You know, very strategic, and he used the platform what it's supposed to be used on to do that because he hit multiple points, and it uh, multiple points. All in one, 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 one night, and that's what they can't stand, because you know, because he called them out on their bullshit. Now, when I, when I say this before, when I say white supremacy, he's calling out that. You got some of these, um, um, some of these jokers tweeting and trolling and all this stuff, saying like, "Oh, well, I'm not going to watch again," because what he said was anti-rape, anti-white, and <clears throat> excuse me, he said it was anti-white. Saying like um, war cops, anything like that. That man didn't say nothing of the sort. He mentioned white supremacy. He didn't mention white people. When we say white supremacy, we talking about the system of white supremacy and the people who use it to practice, to practice white supremacy. People like this peroxide blonde haired bitch Tommy Lauren, who's just like you one strip of look like she just um, one come bucket away from doing a full porno. Or whatever, all the way to all these other idiots and there, you know, and, and also some cool, it's also some black people too that's also had questioned uh, Jesse's um, loyalness, like you know, because they focus on the mom, because you know, because his mom white and his dad and his father's black, you know, somebody saying, oh well, you know, he ain't no brother, he's mixed, da 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 da, fuck y'all. Y'all motherfuckers need to get over yourself. That's a brother, no matter what. Y'all said the same thing about President Obama as about being biracial. And that's what they were saying at first. But see, now you're talking about saying, like, they don't even call him that no more. They just say, oh, the black president. But see, now they start to say it with Jesse Williams, like, you know, they and now they want, now you got them getting out there and calling them the N-word, calling them nigger and all this stuff. It's just crazy. But the problem is, see, the problem is white supremacy, they, they get all bent out of shape and they can't handle the truth when, when facts and truth are thrown right there in their face. And then they try to dodge the question or try to deflect it with certain situations, talking about saying, oh, well, shoot, black people can be raped. Black people, I've seen a lot of racist black people and da-da-da. Um, shoot, I don't, they, more, they more racist than white folks and all that. Let me say this again to you idiots. Black people cannot, a key word, cannot be racist, okay? We don't have a system in place in order to go ahead to practice those means of discrimination and white supremacy or anything, anything like that, period. We don't have a system in place. And even if we did and operate from it, it wouldn't benefit us anyway in the first place. Not now, not ever, because we the only people who... That's out here. We never held anybody else back. We never held anybody else back. In fact, it's a lot of times and stuff, we'll put people of a different ethnicity or a different nationality, show them the ropes like on the job site. You know, we be the veteran, we train them and everything, and we go, we always encourage them like this. This is how you do this, how you do that. And, you know, if they decide to go ahead and move on or go ahead and move on to another department and all that, ain't no hateration going on here. Just go ahead. Hey, you did what you got to do. You know what I'm saying? And you know, and there's some people. Hell, even I done helped along the way. You know, besides my own, <clears throat> besides my own. So you know, like I said, like you know, but you know, we take that like with humility. You know, and let's see. They don't want to be called out on it. And see, people, people like with Tommy Lauren. You know this. You know this. This proves one thing too. It also exposes their hand. It also exposes their hand as well. That 
and it proves my point even more that they sit up here, on, whether it's on, on social media or whatever, they read our post, they follow it, they troll it. We only matter 24 7. They watch our shows, they read our books that we write, you know, they, you know, they, they, they copy our styles. Copy our hair, steal our heritage, all this, everything like that. They didn't want to turn around here and claim it on their own. Because I'm not, because I'm not gonna stay stuck on 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 this posse or with, with that picture or, or whatever like that. So I can care less. But the thing is, like, I'm just I'm gonna stay on topic on this because um. <clears throat> Thing like with this with, with white supremacists. See, they they no longer get they're getting upset because you know, because they get upset when one of us have a mind of our own. You know, when they try to get out here, they want to try to tell us, you know, how how we should do this or how we should do that. But we very well, damn well got our own mind and we can think for our own selves and we're gonna do things that's basically gonna make sense to us and that's gonna benefit us. You know, you, you gotta understand like how 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 the white how these white supremacists how they operate. Um, yesterday, last night, I was listening to um, Tariq Nasheed's um, um, radio station, and he had a, a, a white uh, suspected white supremacist. Uh, what's the what's the what's the hillbilly's name? Um, David King or something like that. And you know, Tariq eloquently made five steps how, how they, this is the pattern how white supremacists operate when they want to try to debate you and stuff. You know, first thing first, they go, I wish I could find it right now. It's a, basically a five step. Hold on one second, people. One second. If I can find it, I'm going to look it up right now. Yeah, I mean, to read, basically, um, Shut it down. He basically shut it down. And as usual, um, the guy was a, a redneck Trump supporter. Look at five steps, what they do. Which is the common tactics of white supremacists when they're, pre pre when they're presented with facts about the system of racism. First tactic, number one, deny it. Listen well, people, deny it. Second tactic is deflection. Third, deceit. Fourth is ad hom hominem attacks. Then, you know, when they can't really get at you with all that, as fifth is a last resort, then they want to get violent. See, I listened to the whole thing because when it got close to the end, you know, uh, the, he made very violent threats to Tariq, and Tariq took, you know, was calm and cool about that. You know, it was it was real uh, hilarious. He said, you know, because these these are um, online keyboard uh, jokers, keyboard warriors, they get on here and they troll, they, you know, they troll these account our accounts and want to see what we're talking about and everything, everything, so everything like that. I don't even have people like even trolling me. And I'd even, I told them like this straight up, straight up. I say, look, man, stop it, stop it, man, stop it. You, you trying to act all tough and everything behind the keyboard. You saying all this, calling me nigga this, monkey that, and all, all the above. But I guarantee you, like, you know, this is the real world. If you'd have seen me right now, you, you, wouldn't even, you wouldn't even look my way or even say anything. You'd probably go in the other direction. Because I'm, one thing about me, I'm not scared of no white supremacists. I'm not scared of nobody, period. Shoot, I walk the walk and I talk the talk. And anybody that know me personally know how I get down. That's with anybody, no matter who you is. But especially like two white supremacists. I just, I be just like this. I got two older brothers, actually three older brothers, who taught me and my other, my baby brother, very well. So it's like this. I'm the type like this. You want to start something with me, you best better believe I'm going to finish it. Because I ain't got no problem problem with that. Because y'all getting all mad because the fact of the matter that 
my our people were waking up, and uh, yes, and he, um, and acknowledging that, and you know dealing with the white supremacy, um, <clears throat> dealing with white supremacy, and there's some white people too that are waking up. They even tired of the other other bullshit. You know, they don't want to be locked up in there uh, with that, and that's a good thing. That's a that's a real good thing. But to get mad because you know black people we showing unity of love among ourselves we showing solidarity you know we spending our money keeping our money in our community building businesses building uh, enterprises entrepreneurships and on top of that creating jobs you know teaching our kids the fundamentals teaching our children like you know if you don't get out there get a job go ahead and get a job but also at the same time, I also want you to be an entrepreneur, be in business for yourself. Like that. And that's the way how, how it should be. And that's how that's how when I grew up, that's how my daddy was. My daddy had his had his, had his own thing when he was 18, his own a landscaping business. He had him and my mom. Because like, you know, he did his own thing like that. And he had um an auto repair repair shop too back in back in um, I used to, me and my brothers used to walk up there sometime up there to go join them just to hang there or help out, you know. So, you know, we seen the entrepreneurship and all that. Cause my daddy was like this, you know, he, he grew up back in the 19, 20, 1930s and all that, doing very much over racism and over segregation and everything. You know, because he felt like, in his words, I still remember when he said this, he felt like, in his words, said like, he felt like a crap that couldn't tell him nothing. But... He was, at the same time, he also told us that not all of them, ain't, not all of them ain't bad. We got some good white folks out there. In fact, contrary to popular belief, I'll say it like that. It was a white man that showed my daddy how to fix a car. And my dad, my dad was very, is very, you know, God bless his soul, let me rest in paradise. My father, my father was of. Um, have very much a photographic memory. He just showed him something one time, or maybe on one occasion, even twice. Um, and he remember once he showed him how to do it. Man told my dad, "Okay, now you go ahead and do it." And, and everybody knows in my neighborhood, and it, it was like that. That my father, man, he was the best mechanic right there on the block. Anybody had a problem with their car, they came here. They came to him. They came. They came right there. He had the landscaping business and everything like right that too. So, you know, him and mom and him and something like that. And I used to go on some of these uh, job sites with him and stuff and they got it. Got it. But, you know, that's the entrepreneurial spirit. That's what, you know, like I said, got, got in me. And, you know, like I said, I, you know, I'm one of those brothers that teach my, my nephew, my nieces. I always tell them, like, you know, go ahead out there, get, get, get your thing going and stuff like that. So that way you. You, know, you can have something. And, you know, that's one of the few things. See, white supremacists, they don't want to, they don't want to see that because they're afraid of the fact of the matter that, that not only we can we are able to do it, but we're gonna do it better. Person, uh, i.e., Black Wall Street, i.e., Rosewood, you know, two uh, and a few other successful um uh, communities like that, Black Wall Street and all that. We had our own everything. We had our own bus and states, um, bus service. We had our own theaters. We had our own supermarkets. And then what happened? You know, white mobs started getting jealous. Ku Klux Klan come run through there and they tore everything down, burned it up, killed a lot of people. Same thing that they did in Rosewood, which was um, right there um, near the Panhandle of Northwest, Northwest Florida. You know, which now I believe is like what remains to now. Like all that based on a lie that's um, that some white woman said that a black guy had raped them. And see, though back then during the time, see those peckerwoods, they were looking for an excuse just to go up in there and kill a lot of people because the fact they hated the success of Rosewood. You know, saying blacks had their own had their own grocery stores, had their own movie theaters. Had their own service. They ain't winning, they ain't accepting nothing from nobody. They kept all the money in there. 
And see, now you look at it, you look like that right now, particularly like here in South Florida. People think like that, there ain't no black owned businesses down here. Well, I digress. In fact, kind of think of it, I'm doing a little promotion right here, right now. You know, when you're down, down here in South Florida, particularly um, in my home, my home part of Liberty City. Yeah, that's right, Liberty City, Florida, and I'm doggone proud of it. You know, everybody, go check out Kyle's Kitchen, man. That's Kyle's Kitchen's 305. That's like on Northwest 62nd Street and, and off 7th Avenue. Be right across the street from Walgreens. You can't miss it. It's the best Caribbean food right there you can get. And see, there's black-owned businesses here. And you can either go here or go right here to Little Haiti. You got a lot of black-owned businesses there. You know, but with the with the coming of gentrification and all that, you got a lot of these developers and all that trying to buy out a lot of these businesses too. But the thing is, we're, we're not going to let this happen. No way, no shape, or how. You know, they're building up these high rises. You know, they they trying to do all that. Try to jack the price up for prop for land property, so that way people that's there they can't afford it. They are offering people money to go ahead and move out and buy the property. Um, at a cheaper price and then turn around and sell it to other ethnicity groups. Now, it's just like what Lawrence Fishburne was telling um, Rick with Boys in the Hood, the same way he said we need to keep all our dollars in our community. Do it the same way like it is with the Jews, same thing with the, with the Cubans, same thing with the Koreans, same thing with the Mexicans and the Italians. We need to keep our money in our neighborhoods. Keep the black dollars here. Because you know, we're the only ones that go ahead, we want to get money and, you know, get money, but then we'll turn right back around and get it right back. That's just, that's some, one of the things that Jesse Williams was talking about. Instead of going ahead and keeping that keeping that dollar in our neighborhood, you know, we, we spend more money than any other nationality out there. We have like a um, $1.2, $1.3 trillion, uh, trillion dollar spending power. But unfortunately, only 2% of that at the time was only given back into the black community. You know, I mean, you see, you know, see what you, you walk around the neighborhood, I mean, yeah, you see a lot of these nice churches being put up and everything like that. And that's sucking money dry out of them. But I haven't seen none of them being put, put nothing back into the community. Now, when I was growing up, back during the 80s and there, everything like that, contrary to popular belief, but I had more respect for the um, neighborhood drug dealers than I did did them, because you know what? When you talk about people like uh, like Convertible Bird, Bucky Brown, Fonda, um, Candyman, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna knock them and all anything like that. I mean, what they did, what they did, but they always at the same time they gave back, you know. I know, in fact, the stories that I've seen where some of these guys have paid people uh, utility bills, or where they or with certain certain people they people that know the neighborhood run short on groceries, they go ahead and give right back. I don't, you know, Rick Brownlee, he gave back over there, open locker. He gave back. So you know, that's why I say I never had no argument about that. But you know. People will probably go ahead and disagree with me, everything. But, you know, that's my personal belief. That's how I seem like that. I didn't agree with how they were how they were getting it through their trade. But I also I also acknowledge the fact that those same people also gave back. Some uh, some cases like you got some of these professional athletes, you know, they're not like a Muhammad Ali, they're not like a Jim Brown, they're not like a Kareem Abdul Jabbar. That, that also, you know, they love their people and they always gave back. But unfortunately, some of these athletes you got today, you only maybe got maybe 2%, maybe 1% that do. But the other 98%, they're too busy buying phantoms, staying in $300,000 homes, going to the clubs, popping bottles, making it rain, blah, 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 this and that. You know. Because perfect example, uh, perfect example for instance, like the same thing, I'm going to just touch on the thing with the Tariq Nasheed debate with that uh, redneck uh, Trump supporter. How he, you know, how that hillbilly idiot was just rambling, talking about saying, well, Dr. Dre, you know, he owns Beach by Dre, 
that's his company and everything like that. I say, <laughs> this stupid motherfucker, Beast by Drayden was never owned by Dr. Trey. Okay? Two. Beast by, Beast by Dre is owned by Monkston. And that's a Monkston 24. That's a white owned company. And all that. Dre, and Dre sold all that to Apple. And see, now Apple has the rights to it. Dre never owned it. And yeah, he got a billion dollars of it. And you know, my problem with people like Dr. Dre, you know, for somebody who say he come from the quote unquote streets, when he gave like a million dollars, instead of giving that million dollars to a historically black college, he goes ahead and gives that million dollars to uh, USC. <laughs> like if that school didn't need enough money as it is already. But then again, that's don't surprise me either because, you know, look with, you know, look with Dr. Dre. So, you know, I always say Dre was suspect to me. You know, Uncle Luke put his ass out there a long time ago, back in the 90s. You know, world-class wrecking crew and everything. But I'm not trying to get off topic on that. I'm trying to get back. I'm going to get back on topic on that. But that's the thing, like, like with the, you know, we need, and see, that's the thing with the white supremacists. They, they don't like it. They don't like it not one bit. You know, you should see some of the comments that I've read. You should see some of the uh, other posts I read from my other colleagues, like from Mr. Griffin, Irving Griffin, to Mr. Superboy223, Torian Rain, Kimberly Frazier, uh, Philip from the Advice Show. Uh, knowledge speaks truth, and a few of my friends over there on on FB too, you know, because it, it's ironic, you know, these same these same jokers they hate our guts, they hate us to the fact that they want to be us, because you know, for one, let's just let's put it like this: they vampires, they can't survive without us. Period. You know, they do everything, even try to steal, you know, steal our culture, and you know. Movies with movies and everything is still our style. Like movies, like with with their bullshit Exodus and the gods of Egypt and all that. They don't even have a history of their own, but then they try to go ahead and pull this off. Now, the movie that came out this weekend. Speaking of cinema, um, I've been seeing the trailer and everything for the movie for Tarzan, and I had a bad feeling in my gut. But even when I seen Samuel L. Jackson on there. Um, Playing, playing on them, but I look at some of the scenes from that trailer where it seems like oh, here we go again. It seems like you got some uh, white guy who's supposed to be in tune, you know, raised by apes and, and so forth and everything, and he comes to the super saiyan to save the day and all that. I, I just, and then the article came up as soon as I thought about that, that, you know, that, um, it was, on, it was on Facebook, let me think of it. It was on Facebook, let me look it up. Yeah, um, it was at the Daily News. Uh, Tarzan ridicules black characters in an incredibly racist movie. And yeah, this this came across there too. So you know, like I say, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on this real quick. I'm gonna just read this out to you. Legend of Tarzan makes a mockery of black characters in an incredibly racist movie. So you know, me Tarzan, you racist, and the person that wrote this article, Linda Stassi, the white lady from New York Daily News. Okay, what year this is again? The new legend, legend of Tarzan is such a crazy racist movie that it makes 1915's Birth of a Nation look like a civil rights epic. Forget diversity at the Academy Awards. The legend of Tarzan treats black actors as though they just exist for black background noise. So true. No, it doesn't matter that Samuel L. Jackson plays George Washington Williams, which was a real-life African-American lawyer and politician. Now, hear Williams speaking like a wise-ass hipster circa 2016 has gone to England to persuade Whitey White Tarzan, which is played by Alexander uh, Skarsgård, to travel with him to the Congo to investigate the enslavement of natives by King Leopold of Belgium. Now, I, I like this how they twist a the little real-life history in there. 
because King Leopold not only he didn't enslave a lot of uh, Africans though, he killed the most Africans there. As well, uh, not just there, uh, added as well as in Ethiopia as well. Let's continue. No, a black man can't do it alone. He needs a bizarrely educated, prefer perfectly mattered white ape boy raised by gorillas to do it. Jackson's character unfortunately soon becomes the black foil to Tarzan, the great white hope. As I as I stated, as I stated, that's, and that's what that's about. Williams is as they used to say before we supposedly enlightened. We were supposedly enlightened. Is the token Negro. He's even wearing a gar a garish purple outfit and spewing outrageous dialogue when we meet him at a stuffy white diplomatic conference in England. Hmm. A garish purple outfit. I wonder if that just slipped that in. You gotta look at these codes when it comes to these things. You know, that's like a acknowledgement to Prince. You know, that's one of those little things. You gotta read between the lines and understand it. It's the first indication, <clears throat> excuse me. It's the first indication that you entered a movie time machine. Luckily, Jackson is such a good actor, he can make you forget it. Well, for minutes at a time, anyway. Why he's there, which seems to be the only uh, a sewage white white movie go of guilt. And by the way, it doesn't work. After seeing this thing. I felt as guilty as a slave, not as a slaver myself. In this laugh to you cringe action movie, Tarzan, blonde locks flowing, pecks of flying, not only has to save his wife Jane, played by Margaret Robbie, from the evil white slaver, but he almost had to single handedly defeat an entire army, as well as a phalanx of evil, uh, here you go, evil black tribal guys in white faces. See, I figured she was going to put that shit in here. See, they always want to refer to black as being evil and white being good. You know, the color code, color code thing right there. You know, it's even in the dictionary. Black, dark, evil right there. White, pure. It, it's, it's, it's crazy. You know, but this dialogue going to be changed too. Why? To, again, almost single-handedly free all the black slaves in the Congo. Tarzan slaver say slayer. No, you won't see any roots type brutality, brutal reality here. Instead, the slaves get captured, but easily escape with the help of Tarzan and Jane's resourcefulness and some help from Williams who can buy a cannon like nobody. Now, the uh, Jaman John Hans, Hansu, who married the uh, Kamora Lee Simmons, even he's in the movie. He plays a tribal leader out to kill Tarzan. And they say that it was totally wasted despite his nifty leopard ghetto. But the worst of the worst doesn't come until the end of the free slaves and tribemen, which all in loincloths line up to cheer Tarzan for saving them. Mm -hmm. Great White Hope Syndrome. The director, David Yates, actually told the Los Angeles Times that all that racist baggage that belonged to the earlier books or earlier B movies, there's no place for that. This is a modern film with modern sensibilities. God help us if he's right. Reality check. Over 10 million Congolese slaves died horrible deaths thanks to King Leopold. And Yates thinks his Tarzan scenario in which the black slaves were really saved by a white ape man is not racist. <laughs> Yates must be gone ape shit. If you didn't know any better, you'd think the latest Tarzan movie was a male books production. All that missing of all that's missing are dancers, slaves, and chains. Springtime for Leopold in Africa. Yeah, so that it, that thing there, it really didn't surprise me, not one bit. You know, this is an, this another attempt, you know, with the white supremacists thinking like, oh, well, you know, the quote-unquote, the niggas are savages and all this stuff like that. So we got to do things to keep them in check. Yeah, just like what they did in Ferguson in 2014 and all that when they when uh, Ferguson Police Department, St. Louis County Police Department and all that using uh, high power snipers, armored vehicles, tear gas and all this stuff, military. Um, 
military um, personnel and all this stuff just to go ahead and shoot at protesters, unarmed protesters and everything. So that's that's how they figure when it comes down to that. But but you know, right now the Jesse Wynn speech, it's it's got them in the up war and it's calling them out on their bullshit. And the problem is they can't handle the truth. They, they can't do it. They can't do um do anything like that. But you know, we're gonna, gonna keep gonna keep an eye on this. I'm gonna keep an eye on everything on, on, on this uh situation with Jesse Williams because you know you're gonna have some asshole that's gonna come out there. Because like I said, they're so mad, but it also it forces their hand. It's like the same thing when the Star Wars movie, The Force Awakens, came out. You know, you had you had uh, white guys getting out here committing suicide because they got upset because they see the brother in the trailer in the movie wielding the lightsaber. And see, idiots don't realize Star Wars has always been about melanin. But anyway, I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna, let me jump back on here about with, with Stephen A. Smith. Uh, I call him Stephen A. At Stephen Asshole Smith. You know, he's got a personal uh, issue with Kevin Durant. He's got a very much personal issue with Kevin Kevin Durant, and that's why I, you know, he said what he said. But see, but the average the average dudes. You know that I know they'll go ahead and take it and try. Tell myself, oh, what? Man, Stephen A. Smith, one of the realest cools out there. Like that, I never liked the Stephen A. Smith because I felt like he was just an arrogant, big mouth, uh, nobody, and all that. But he's bitter. He's bitter, just like Christopher Darden. Bitter like Jimmy Walker. You know, J.J. Evans from Good Times. You know, both of them, both of them jokers are in their sixties and they bitter as hell. Stephen A. Smith, he's bitter because, you know, 20 years ago, he used to play, like, college balls and he blew his knee out, and he never made it to the next level in, in the pros and everything. It's just like what Willie D. said on his song, Coon, when it refers to Stephen A. Smith. You got a chip on your shoulder because your ball game sucks, but you got to end up working with players that your wife want to fuck. So, you know, but see... Stephen A. Smith is one of those type, type of cats, you know, that he loved white people. You know, when he said that crap over there, Alabama, a and and somebody saying that racism don't exist, I nearly threw a rock at, my, at, at, a, at a TV screen when I saw him. You know, that's just how much I despise him, you know. And to all the people out there, comment, sports commentators, so-called sports analysis, and sports fans, who up here hating on Kevin Durant because he left OKC to go to the Golden State Warriors. Man, sit down, eat a fat one, and go on with your life. That man's going on with his life. He's a grown man. He make his own decisions. At the end of the day, he doing what's best for KD. If this better his chances of him getting the championship ring, so be it. You know, that's almost what I, I have to say about most of that. So I'm going to just do like this. You know, shout out to all the black-owned businesses down here in South Florida, and Miami-Dade, Miami Day, Broward, Palm Beach area, and all that. And like I say once again, everybody, please go ahead and check out Kai's Kitchen 305. That's on 62nd, Northwest 62nd Street and 7th Avenue. And, you know, best Caribbean food that you can get. You get more bang for your buck. And believe me, you know what I'm saying, it is worth it. It's worth every bit of it. While you at it, also, if you want some new gear, new paraphernalia, Anything like that. Check out Green and Sons, which is next door there too. Um, brother Tyrone Green, man, he's still running running the show over there. Everything. If you want some like black on stuff, that's where to go. This your man, this your boy here, Mr. O. I gotta go ahead, I'm gonna sign out. That's all I have to say. So I just had to do this little podcast right here. Shout out to Mr. Urban Griffin, shout out to Mr. Superboy two two three, shout out to Tony and Rain, shout out to the Samsung Knights, shout out to feel of the advice show. So I got to go ahead, run up out of here because I got some bills I got to pay. So I'm going to catch y'all on the next rebound or I'm going to catch y'all later on tonight. It's your man, Mr. O, signing out. Peace.